You guys ready to worship the Lord? Yes. Great. We'd love to have it. I just watched that tape. I look really old now. <laughs> My hair is starting to look like Warren's, and I'm telling you, I'm going to wash that gray right out of my head. Anyways, guys, again, just as we said in the video, if you haven't yet, please take out your phones and text CHECK to 661-589-0424, and that's where you receive lyrics to the music, you'll have all kinds of information, and it helps us understand what's going on with the services on Sundays and how to better do church for you. And also, if you are a first-time guest, a lot of people don't even do it, but if you would come out after service, we have a gift we'd like to give you just to say thank you for spending your Sunday with us. And truly in our hearts, we hope that you can find grace, a place that you would call home. So with that, we are going to open up in a word of prayer, and we are going to start by praising the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me? Father God, we come to you today. Lord, as we celebrate the 4th of July, Lord, it's only because of you that we are. Lord, you laid the foundation, you empowered the men, and by your Holy Spirit, you created a country. So, Lord, today we come before you. We thank you for that. But, Lord, more than anything, we just want to praise you because you are so deserving of all praise, glory, and honor. Today, Lord, we want to celebrate you. So, Lord, we just pray that by your spirit you would meet, meet each person here, touch our lives. Lord, that your word would fall deep into our heart and that our praises would be a blessing to you. So, Father, we just, again, surrender afresh in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise to our feet and praise the Lord. And actually, before we do, just in, um, you can still rise to your feet, please, and sing with us. But we are going to sing a couple of songs in celebration of Independence Day before we move into worshiping the Lord. If you would sing with us, please. bombardment, known as the Battle of Baltimore, came only weeks after the British had attacked Washington, D.C., burning the Capitol, the Treasury, and the President's house. It was another chapter in the ongoing war of 1812. A week earlier, Francis Scott Key, a 35-year-old American lawyer, had boarded a flagship of the British fleet on the Chesapeake Bay in the hopes of persuading the British to release a friend who had recently been arrested. Key's tactics were successful, but because he and his compa companions had gained knowledge of the impending attack on Baltimore, the British did not let them go. They allowed the Americans to return to their own vessel, but they continued to guard them. Under the, this scrutiny, Key watched on September 13th as the barrage of Fort McHenry began eight miles away. It seemed as though the earth had opened and it was vomiting shot and shell in a sleet, a sheet of fire and brimstone, he wrote later. But when the darkness arrived, he only saw the red erupting in the night sky. Given the scale of the attack, he was certain the British would win. 
The hours passed slowly, but in the clearing smoke of the dawn's early light on September 14th, he saw the American flag, not the British Union flag, Jack flying over the fort, announcing an American victory. He put his thoughts on paper while still aboard the ship, setting his words to the tune of a popular English so song. His brother-in-law, commander of a militia at Fort McHenry, read Key's work, and it had distributed under the name The Defense of Fort McHenry. The Baltimore Patriot newspaper soon printed it, and within weeks, Key's poem, now called The Star-Spangled Banner, appeared in print all across the country, immortalizing his words and forever naming the flag it celebrated. Nearly two centuries later, the flag that inspired Key still survives, though it is fragile and worn by the years. And it has inspired us to continue to honor our country. So.
Father, we praise you. Father, there's none like you. And Father, you are so much greater than anything else. And we pray that as we move throughout this week, that our lives, Father, would affirm, Father, that what we have just sang about your greatness and your goodness. We pray for Andy as he comes and brings your word, that you would speak to us through it, and that we would live out the truths that we hear as we go from this place. Amen. Well, good morning and happy Independence Day. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn to the book of Revelation. As we continue our verse-by-verse study of the book, we're going to be in chapter 18 today. We've been working through the judgments. We've seen the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bold judgments. And then we have come to another parenthesis that gives us some detail of what that judgment is going to look like more specifically, and we looked at chapter 17 at the beginning of the fall of Babylon, and we're going to continue as we look at the fall of Babylon today in chapter 18. So if you will, join me as we begin in verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her, in the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously. In the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. and She will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord who judges her. Then the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore, merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. The fruit that your soul long for has gone from you and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you and you shall find them no more at all the merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment weeping and wailing and saying alas alas that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, has adorned with precious gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster and all who traveled by ships, sailors, as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of a burning city, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, 
for God has avenged you of her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus, with violence, the great city of Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you any more. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you any more, and the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you any more. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of a bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and of all who were slain on the earth. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this passage today, and we ask that you would, Lord, open our eyes, that we can not only understand what is to come, but Lord, that we would make application to our lives as well. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. As a young college student, I was excited to be a part of the North Carolina State Marching Band, and I was able to go on a trip in 1992 to the Meadowlands when NC State was a part of the kickoff classic and we faced the Iowa Hawkeyes. And of course, we upset them and beat them. But the highlight of the trip for me was going in to New York City. I had been to New York as a kid one time, but it was different going as an adult and just seeing that skyline. And The thing that, of course, stood out to me were the World Trade Center buildings. They skyrocketed above the skyline, and they represented all the economic power that New York City is. And I can never imagine that just nine years later, these two amazing colossal buildings would be destroyed to rubble in a small amount of time. And while the city remains standing, The impact was not just felt in that city, but across the nation. And today, we see that God is not only going to destroy a symbol of economic power of man, but he is going to wipe it out totally and completely. And as American Christians, we need to heed the lesson we learned today. As we celebrate our 245th birthday as a nation, we need to remember who our God is. While our money declares in God we trust, sadly, many trust the money over our God. And when Babylon is destroyed, we will all be reminded the foolishness of trusting in the material. So let's look at this passage, and we see it begins with a pronouncement in verse 1. We see an angel that comes, and this angel is shown in splendor. There's a glow around this angel that lights up the earth, representing God's glory and authority. And and we see that the first thing this angel does is pronounce a judgment to the wicked. And we see that it begins with what is to come, and that is the fall. In verse 2, we read that Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen. We see a pronouncement that Babylon will be utterly destroyed. We saw last week the history of Babylon. We don't have time to go back in depth. But we remember that starting in Genesis, that that was where the group came together and began to form Babylon. And they sought to build a world-dominant city and power that would go against God. They started with the Tower of Babel that would skyrocket into the world to declare its greatness. And then we know that King Nebuchadnezzar was the first one that was raised up to have a world empire that ruled the entire world. And Babylon in the Bible became synonymous with a world system seeking to replace God in his ways. We then looked in chapter 17 last week that Babylon formed a religious element that sought to get people to worship together a false god. 
And today, what we will see is that there is also an economic and a commercial element where greed and power are the desire of men. And we see again that God will come and crush this system. Many scholars believe that the city of Babylon will actually be rebuilt in Iraq. And thus, there'll be three great cities that influence the Antichrist kingdom. There will be Rome, which governs the political aspect, Jerusalem, which will govern the religious, and Babylon, which will be the economic. And we see that the destruction will not only come to this city, but the whole entire system. The words is fallen, is fallen is a way that the Bible uses to emphasize the completeness and the speed in which this will take place. And there will be no doubt that this was done by God and it was a judgment on the ultimate idol that man has built and it will become destroyed. We also see the pronouncement of why this takes place and that is because it is under the control of demons. We see here that as you read that it is referred to as a dwelling place for demons to exist. And so what is taking place is demonic. The Bible warns us that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And we see that every foul thing will take place when it's associated with the world system. Why do people take drugs? Because there are people who are making money off of selling it. Why do people do pornography? Because there are people who are making money off of it. Why do people have an abortion industry where they kill babies? Because there are people who are making money off of it. Why are there companies now that support the LGBTQ plus community? Because they are making money off of it, all those who fall into greed will become prisoners of this system. And this is just a foretaste of the evils that will come as the greed of man and his lust will be unchecked. It will be as in the days of Noah where the only thought of man is evil. And people will be taken advantage of and used so money can be made. We also see the who that is mentioned in this passage. It mentions that there are nations and kings and merchants where this judgment will come. This is not just a regional judgment, but it is worldwide. As it says, all of the nations have come and drunk from the cup of adulteries. We saw last week the influence of how this religion spread and opposed the true God. And now we see a worldwide economy that is formed by these kings. And the rich will profit to gain obscene wealth and power. And folks, we don't have to look very far to see that that's taking place in our time. We already see a global impact of a world economy and world leaders are already calling for more and more of a system that will unite the world as one economic power. And we can already begin to see the result of how money and business is going to be tied to opposing God and his ways. We don't have to look very far. We can look in our own country. Think just a few years ago, the state of North Carolina came and said, you know what, we have a law that says men can't go into girls' bathrooms. Makes sense to me. But the NCAA came out and said, we won't hold any more basketball tournaments. We won't hold any more championships in your state if you continue to have that law. Companies came and said, we won't do business anymore in your state if you continue to have that law. Entertainment artists came and said, we won't do concerts anymore in your state if you continue to have that law. And so what did they do? They got rid of the law. The Babylon system is upon us. And it's evident 
This is not being led by some man behind a curtain. These are demonic forces that is bringing this all together. And it's being controlled, as Ephesians 6 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we see the nations and the kings and the merchants are profiting off of this scheme. And it's because they've invited these demonic forces in and allowed them to dwell there. But not only do we see the wicked have a pronouncement, but in verse 4, we also see a message comes to the redeemed. And it says in verse 4, there was another voice that came from heaven. And, and we see, first of all, what is called to these. And, and it says that they must come out and render. The word to come out here means to leave the world. Now, earlier, Jesus had told the disciples that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. We were to let our light shine so the darkness could be reached. But what is taking place now is that the offer of grace, the offer of mercy, the offer of forgiveness is now over. And judgment is at hand. And he tells them it is time to come out. We see a similar story in the book of Genesis. We see three angels that were sent to come and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Those angels came to Abraham first. And Abraham said, well, well God, will you please not do it if there's 50 righteous? If there's not 40, if there's 30, 20, just 10, if there's just 10. And he said, okay, I'll hold back. But guess what? There weren't even 10. And so the angels come into the city and they come and they warn Lot and his family, and they say, come out, leave, and don't turn back. Well, sadly, as they're leaving, his wife, she does turn back and turns into a pillar of salt. And God's judgment comes upon the world, and sometimes, folks, we may lose some money and possessions when God puts his judgment on us. And yet, as Christians, our trust should not be in those things. Lot's wife looked back because her trust, her hope, her satisfaction was in what she left behind and not what she was looking forward to. It was in the things that she had left, not in the God who saved her. And the call to come out is to leave behind and trust in God. And if we have not become of the world, then this is easy to do. But sadly, I think many are deceived, and I believe this temptation is the most difficult on the American church. We have so much wealth, so many struggle to be called out of Babylon. But the truth is he has already called us out to not be part of the world. And so church, we must not trust in riches. They're only temporary. The, only, the other thing that we see here is that not only are we to come out, but he says to render. That word means to repay or to pay back. The Bible reminds the believer that what you sow, one day you will reap. And now it has come time for Babylon to reap what she has sown. And so the judgment will come and fall upon her. This rendering is not something we will do. This is something that God is going to do. He will be the one who brings his vengeance. He will be the one who brings the payback. But we are called to celebrate in God's judgment upon Babylon. Jeremiah saw this day coming. We read in Jeremiah 50, Shout against her all around. She has given her hand. Her foundations have fallen. Her walls are thrown down. For it is the vengeance of the Lord. Take vengeance on her. And she has done so due to her. And then in verse 29, he continues, Call together the archers against Babylon. All you who bend the bow and camp against it all around, let none of them escape. Repay her according to her work, according to all that she has done due to her. For she has been proud against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. 
And folks, we are reminded very clearly in Scripture that we are not to make friends with Babylon. We are not to embrace the world system. First John says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. We also see that this voice comes and not only announces what is going to come, but the who. And we see in verse 4 that this is talking, come out of her, my people. We know that God's people are those who choose to love him, to follow him, to receive his salvation. The Bible makes clear this is not a fleshly thing to become part of God's people, but it is a spiritual thing. Being Jewish and a part of Israel does not make you God's people. It's being a part of spiritual Israel that makes you God's people. Romans 2 says this, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision that is of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. In Romans, he continues, and he says, But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, Nor are they all children because they are seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Folks, today we need to make sure that we are a people of God. And the Bible makes it clear that you are not a child of God because you had Christian parents. You're not a child of God because you look and go, well, you know, I wasn't born in Saudi Arabia. I wasn't born in a Muslim country. Therefore, I must be a Christian. I'm in America. You're not a child of God because you went through a ritual. Even if you were baptized in these waters, that doesn't make you a child of God. The Bible makes clear you must be born again. You must confess that you are a sinner. You must turn from your sin and believe on the one who went and died for the penalty of your sin, Jesus Christ, and rose again three days later. You must be born again and saved to be a part of his people. Third, we see the pronouncement that comes to the redeemed is the why. And and we see that there's two reasons that he comes and explains why this judgment is coming and why they must come out and render the first thing he says is that sin will be punished in verse 5 we see that Babylon's sin has reached all the way to heaven and God says listen I will punish sin there is a season there is a time of forgiveness there is a time of repentance God does not desire the punishment of the wicked he desires that they would return and receive salvation but do not Believe that God will not one day punish sin. And he comes here and he makes it known and he says this day has come. And judgment for sin will come upon all sin that is not washed in the blood of our Savior. The second reason he says there is pride. If you look in verses 6 and 7, you see her pride and you see that she is a queen that declares herself the God of this world with Satan. She's married to him, and she says, listen, I will never die. I will never be a widow. I'm invincible. I will never have sorrow. If you'll just follow my ways, you will always be happy and have everything. If you can just have more money, more things, you will just be filled with goodness. Isn't that the lie of the world? She thinks that she can't be conquered. But the Bible warns, pride comes before the fall. And then we see that she has luxury. She has luxurious living, it describes. And it says that word actually means to live sensually. 
And so she lived in lust. Whatever her eyes desired, she took for herself. She saw the poor. She saw the needy. She saw the hurting, and she just didn't care. She just wanted more. And so she built up for herself treasure upon treasure. She forgot that she didn't own anything, but that she was only a steward. All of this belongs to God. Folks, one day you and I will give an account for the stewardship of ourselves. And what have we done to help other people in need? God blesses some for this purpose, to be able to help others. And yet there's so many so-called Christians out there that are just hoarding more stuff for themselves. They're not generous towards others. They rob God by not giving him the first 10% back to him and his church. They judge their success by the size of their house, by the toys they acquire, and the amount of money that they have in their bank account. But this is what Ephesians says. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give who has need. So we're called not to steal, not to live off of the system, but we're called to work and to work hard for this purpose, that we may have so that we can bless others who are hurting. And so many times... We get to the place where we think that if we can just get more and more and more, we'll fill the void in our heart. And the reality is, is there's only one thing that can fill that void. That's Jesus Christ. Having the latest fashion, having the greatest and newest technology, having the best vacations, having the biggest house will never give you joy. But giving to God and his work will be what will bring you joy. Jesus said it like this, and we have to believe it. It is better to give than to receive. And Babylon will be judged because of her wasteful living. And then we finally see the when in verse 8. It says this will happen in just one day. Until she is utterly destroyed, it will be quick, it will be decisive, it will begin and be totally, she will be wiped out with death and mourning and famine and fire. Babylon will be burnt to the ground. There will be nothing left but ashes. And the world system will realize that our God is greater. Notice the Bible says this in Psalms 127.1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Folks, the Lord is building his kingdom. And if you want to be a part of something that is going to be eternal and make a difference, all your time and effort needs to be in the kingdom of God. Because unless he's building it, you're wasting your time, the Bible says it. How much time and effort do we spend in things that are going to just be wasted away? Where the malls and the rust will come and destroy, where others can come and steal it, where in the end it will be burnt. And he tells us, spend your time and your talent and your treasure with what the Lord is building. We see here in verses 9 through 18, he transitions and he begins to talk about those who are affected by the destruction of Babylon. And he begins with those who are in mourning. And we see that there will be much weeping over the loss of Babylon. And we see three distinct people. The first is found in verses 9 and 10. And we see that he talks about the king's of the nations who will lose their power and their wealth and they will thus weep over their loss. They've benefited greatly by the lies of others and we see our politicians doing this today. Don't we get frustrated when our politicians make laws that they don't live by? 
They complain about the hardworking person out there who is getting rich. But let me tell you, they don't mind taking that money from those people and then living high on the hog themselves. And the day will come when the kings will be humbled and their wealth will be taken away. In verses 11 through 17, we see the merchants that are listed. And, And as you read through the list, you can see every type of business is included, from luxuries to staples to things common to things that are rare, from valuable to mundane. The world economy will tumble, and those who trusted in riches will realize their foolishness of placing their hope in these things. We see them from a distance, weeping and wailing, in deep grief over the loss of the beauty of their goods and the amazement of how quick it happened. And the world economy will be impacted and those who live in obscene luxury will be devastated because that will be their God and their wealth will be obliterated. And how foolish is it for man to hold on to gold as their hope when the Bible tells us when we get to heaven, gold is just going to be the streets that we walk upon. We should not put our trust in material wealth, but God. And then we see here the mariners, those who delivered their goods by ship. They're out there in the sea. They see the destruction of Babylon. And it says they are weeping and wailing over the loss of the wealth that they don't have. Notice here the heart of man with the kings and the the merchants and, and the sailors. Here we come and we see that they're weeping over the, not over the rebelling against God that they've done. They don't ever weep over the moral evils that they have done. Notice what they weep over. The loss of material possessions. And you know what's interesting? In verse 13, it tells us that some of that money is going to be made off of the bodies and souls of men. They don't even care how they treat other people as long as they make money off of it. Doesn't matter whether that evil is slavery or human trafficking or selling body parts from abortions. As long as they make money, they don't care. And what they grieve about is not sinning against the holy God. What they grieve is the loss of the things that they have. Many believe the solution to man's problem is overcoming poverty. Yet this is the problem. The people who are trying to help the poor often are trying to get rich off of helping them. Let me tell you, there's only one way we can truly help the poor. It's when people of God generously and out of their own heart give to help other people. Let me tell you, it's real easy for me to say, hey, give me your money, and then, hey, I'll help you out. It's always easy to help other people with other people's money. Have you noticed that? I have found that in church work. You know, I have found sometimes it's real easy for people to say, well, let's just spend all that money to do this. It's always easy to spend other people's money, amen? Amen. But when it costs you, that's the question. And when it costs you, that is love. That is sacrifice. That is being generous. And what we need is for the church to be generous, not to hoard for themselves, but to be able to say, I see the world and it's hurting and I can make a difference if I will choose to enter into that pain and to give and to demonstrate love to my fellow man. We then see here the rejoicers in verse 20, a different group of people who are listed. And it tells us here to rejoice over her, O heavens, you who are holy, who are apostles and prophets. That word there, holy, tells us 
that it's the word that means saints. It literally means the holy ones. And it's referring to those who have been saved by Jesus. You know what's awesome, friends? If you are a follower of Jesus today, you are a saint. Isn't that awesome to think about? You're not a saint by what you do, because if that was us, we're in trouble. But how many of you know the blood of Jesus Christ washes away not some of our sin, not most of our sin, all of our sin? And in him, we receive his righteousness. And today, we can boldly say, I'm a saint of God if I have been washed and believed in Jesus. Then we see the second group, the apostles. Those are those who followed Jesus under his earthly ministry. And then it refers to the prophets, those who believed in Jesus, the Messiah, before he came physically to earth. And this is interesting. The first time in the book of Revelation that those in heaven are commanded to rejoice. We saw earlier that there were tears that came from the tribulation saints. We saw earlier that there were tears when the Bema seat, the, the judgment seat of Christ for rewards is taking place. But, but now we see that there is a command that comes to those who are heaven and they are called to rejoice, to give joy in what is about to take place in Babylon. And why is that? Well, he continues this messenger and explains that this system that persecuted us, that tempted us, that mocked our God will now be brought to justice. And God will bring vengeance. And he uses a descriptive language in verse 21 where he comes and he says, there will be a large millstone that will be thrown into the sea and it will come and it will be bring utter destruction upon Babylon. And there will be no more music, marriage, parties, work. It'll all be wiped away and the judgment will not be only for their evil, but for the evil that they caused others to do. Jesus said this in Mark 9, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Folks, it's a terrible thing to sin. But let me tell you, there is a greater judgment if you lead others into sin. And let me tell you, you need to be careful of not only what you are doing, but who you are bringing and allowing to enter into sin by what you're doing. You will be held to account. The blood of God's people has been spilt by the world system. And now God says in verse 21 that now he will bring his vengeance upon Babylon. So what can we take from this lesson? Two main things. Number one, we need to come out. We need to come out of the world. Now, this does not mean we leave the world. In fact, we are to remain in the world. We're to love our neighbors, our coworkers, our fellow students. But we need to pull away of being of the world in the world system. And there's two reasons. Number one, judgment is coming. And we need to not be deceived. This world is going to be judged. And those who turn and look back will be destroyed as we saw with Lot's wife. And if you are being tempted and pulled away from the things of the world, let me tell you, today is the day that you make the decision, I'm not going to live for those things anymore. It's interesting, Jesus tells a parable in Luke chapter 12. He says this, as he begins to tell this parable, it says, then one from the crowd said to him, teacher, my brother, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. 
But Jesus said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And then Jesus comes and he tells a parable about this man who built a barn and he had all these things. And then he's like, well, I'm just going to tear down my barn. I have so much stuff and I'll build more barns so I can have more stuff. And then God looks at that man and says, you are a fool because tonight you're going to die. And then what's going to happen to all that stuff? And God says, that's everybody who is not rich towards God. Let me ask you something. Are you rich towards God? You you see, the Bible says this. We're to give the first fruits to God. But folks, let's be honest. Many in the church give God the leftovers. They live for themselves first. They make sure not only they have what they need, they make sure they get everything that they want. And then if they have anything left over, they'll give it to God. But God says, I'm worthy of the first fruits. So judgment is coming. But the second reason we need to come out is because we should desire to live holy. We should have a desire to want to please God. We should have a desire to want to influence others. Let me tell you something. There is, should be no shame. There should be no guilt whatsoever in enjoying the blessings that God has given you in your life. God has blessed many of us. And we should enjoy the things that he has given us because he finds joy in us enjoying the gifts that he has given us. But folks, we can't be hoarders of earthly treasure. What we need to do is make sure that we're also rich about getting the gospel out. And that means that we have to live holy and we live different than the world. And our talk matches our walk and, and, and we begin to become stewards of our time and our talent and our treasure so that our lives have eternal impact. So what does this mean practically? Folks, it means that, that we begin to change some of our behavior because we know that some of what we're doing is supporting Babylon. Babylon. So we look out there and say, you know what, I'm not going to go to that movie and give that movie theater and those producers and that company my money to put that filth out there. I'm not going to buy those TV channels and support that filth. You know what, I'm not, if I can choose an option between option A and option B, and I know that this company is endorsing this stuff and this one isn't, I'm not going to support that company even if it may cost me an extra dollar. I'm going to start making decisions that honor and reflect and glorify God because I realize it's not about money. It's about bringing God glory and it's about the kingdom. Some of us look and go, man, well, you know, I really don't have a lot of resources and most of us don't have an excessive abundance amount. But how many of you know that when you die, you end up getting a lot of money? That's unfortunate it works that way, but that's how it happens. You die and then you sell all your possessions and you realize, wow, I've got quite a bit there. You know what I'm amazed about is how many Christians do not tithe off of their wealth to the local church and to his kingdom. How many of you have your will already ready and you have God honored in your will? Everybody here should say, amen, I do. I will say I do. I have Grace Baptist Church already in my will. And if you don't, you should. You should be giving to the God first, amen? Second thing, not only do we need to come out of the world and not attach ourselves, but we also need to finally know the season. 
You know, in Ecclesiastes 3, it tells us there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. There's a time to love and a time to hate. There's a time for war and there is a time for peace. And I know we all yearn for the day that the world is going to get what it deserves. But the reason revelation is given is so that our faith will be encouraged, that we know that that day is coming. But we need to realize that at this time, we don't live in that season. And currently, we live in the gospel age, the church age. And this is how the Bible instructs us to live. Notice what the Bible says in Romans 12. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not let your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink, for in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not overcome Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, folks, what we're to do in this season is to turn the other cheek, to walk two miles instead of one, to let them stone us and say, God, forgive them. But we will remember one day God is going to render judgment and we will see the wrath and we will see our blood atone for. And at that time, God says, rejoice in the just judgment that is coming. But until that day, we must live in the season in which God has placed us. There was a man that was one day asked to unload a new delivery of baby chicks. And there were 45,000 of them and there was a danger of keeping them all and bunched in together and they would suffocate so they had to spread them out. And so there was a time of being able to move the chicks around and there was one of the chickens, one of the guys who had never done this before and he noticed it had a distinct black mark on it. And his friend looked at that and said, you know what that is? That is the mark of death. And he said, what do you mean? And he says, listen, chicklings will not tolerate any variation of any kind. A light or a dark spark being undersized or oversized, possessing a scratch or even a light lump is all it takes for it to become a target. And then the other chicks are drawn to the distinctive marking and they will begin to savagely peck at them until they have killed the marked chick. And you know something, folks? That's the same way the world is. The world wants conformity. And if you don't talk like they talk, and you don't do as they do, and you don't believe as they believe, let me tell you, they're going to come pecking at you. And what we need is we need a bold church that says, you know what? I will not give in. I will stand for the grace and the truth of our God. Jesus said this, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, we just want to come before you, and Lord, um, we just ask that there's anybody here today who is not a part of your people, that they would understand that's not something that they are born into in the flesh. It's not anything that they can do in the flesh by going through a ritual. But Lord, they must be born again. They must come and admit that they are a sinner and say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and three days later you rose again from the dead. And Lord, I pray today that salvation would come. 
Lord, that we would truly search if we're really a part of your people. If we're not, today we'd make that decision to trust in Jesus. Father, I pray for those here, Lord, as we all are enticed by the things of this world. God, we, we so many, so evilly exchange, Lord, our wonderful God for the things that you have made and blessed us with. Father, we think somehow that having more money and having a bigger house and a faster car and this and that will somehow fill a void in our life. And God, we have to confess that, Lord, many times we're worldly. God, we have to confess today that that many times we look and we see people struggling and we just don't care to help. God, we want to be different. We want to be people who choose to give of what you have given us to be a blessing to others. Lord, we want to come out of the world. So, Lord, when that day comes, it'll be an easy decision and we'll never look back because we know where our trust is is not in the things that are here, but in the one who is calling us out. Father, we would ask that you would do a great work in us this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today and you don't know where you would spend eternity, you don't know you're a part of God's people and you've made that decision today or you'd like to talk about that, In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing a song. I'll be standing up here. I'd love to be able to celebrate that with you, give you some information to help you grow in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you're making that decision today to trust Jesus for the first time, I'm just going to ask you to courageously come forward and let me pray with you and may help you have that information to be able to grow in a relationship with Christ. And if you're online, you can just simply text the word HOPE to 661-589-0424. And you can receive that information. And then maybe you're here today and you just realize, you know what? If I'm honest, I'm not rich towards God. I'm rich towards myself, but I'm not rich towards God. And that needs to change. And today, maybe you just like to come and pray that God would change your heart. There's also some things I'd like for us to pray this morning. I'd like to pray for our nation. It's our nation's birthday. We were started as a nation that was founded on some godly principles, and man, we have turned away from that. We need to thank God for how our nation began, but we also need to come and confess the sin of our nation and ask God to give forgiveness and to give us time to repent. And we need to pray for revival in God's church in America. This week, our youth will be going up to camp. Today, would you come and pray at the altar and say, God, would you get a hold of our young people and change their hearts? Would you do a work in them that will not only last for a week, but will last a lifetime? On Wednesday, we're having a day camp for kids, kindergarten through sixth grade, and we have 106 kids signed up for that day camp. Can we this morning, as we sing, come and bathe that in prayer at the altar? Ask God to get a hold of some of those kids' lives and change their heart, maybe call them to be the next pastor or missionary. God wants to do a work this morning. I know it's late, but let's let God do some great things as we hear his voice and obey. Let's stand and sing and respond.
Thank you. you. may be seated for just a moment. As you came in today, you noticed that we had a bulletin, and we have uh, our connection card on the, um, we all can clap, but you better do this or we're not going to have it anymore. Amen. All right. So take out your phones. All right. And you can scan that QR code there. All right. There's your connection card. Or you can just simply text the word CONNECT to 661-589-0424, church number. Text the word CONNECT or just scan the QR code at the bottom. And just take a moment to follow the decisions there and check what applies to you. And then there's a place to write any prayer request that you have. And we'd like for you to just take a moment with the Spirit of God and look at how you're going to make personal application to your life today. Amen? So let's just take a moment and do that together. As we close this morning, I'd like to um, encourage you, if you uh, would like to help with our um, day camp, we could still use some volunteers. And Miss Cindy, raise your hand. She's there. So if you'd like to be able to do that, you can. We're also selling fireworks. If you'd like to help get some, those go to our missions ministry and to help children be able to go on retreats and camps. So we'd love for you to be able to participate in that. And then want to encourage you this week, would you just take some time and just take some concentrated prayer and pray for our country this week and just be in prayer that God will bring us to repentance and that we'll see revival. So with that, let's stand and close in a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. And then next week, we get to move to the good stuff. We get to move to what's taking place in heaven. And we get to see the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to have communion next week. And I want to ask that you'd also just pray that your heart would be ready to have a divine encounter as we worship God through communion next week. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for your word. And God, I just pray that you would bring revival to your church in America. Lord, uh, we're reminded, Lord, that, Lord, this country is not to be worshipped, only you are. But Lord, we do thank you for the founding of this country that was, Lord, a light that was different than many others, that, that believed in your ways and your truth. And Lord, we have strayed from that. So God, we pray that you would give us time to repent and that your church would rise up. And Lord, while the world seeks to conform us, Lord, that we will stand bold in your grace and truth, that we'll love our enemies, but we will not compromise on what you say. And Lord, that we will do this for your glory. Lord, give our children a great day camp. We pray that many of their friends will come and get saved. And Lord, we pray for our youth as they go to camp, that you'll watch over and protect them and meet them there. Lord, that their lives would be changed eternally. Lord, we ask that you would do a great work this week. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.